Ah, the, so this is what is uh, office hours. When I, you mentioned this uh, in Slack, I, I was confused. I mean, office hours? What is that? Yeah, office hours is just a casual time for us to sit down and chat about things. And uh, Luis, you had a, a bunch of questions, so we'll we'll start with you. What's on your mind, Luis? Well, <clears throat> we are uh, in the research phase of a data lake slash data catalog project. So I've I, I've had some idea about a month a month in and uh, what it, its internals, but uh, uh, what I was uh, trying to get mostly. It's uh, the interaction of uh, Amundsen uh, with other pieces of the data lake uh, environment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, <clears throat> basically, you have uh, Amundsen as, as a data catalog, you have a, a query engine, and you have a, perhaps an ETL tool, and your business analytics, your data analytics uh, tool, and visualization as well, which um, this is a straightforward visualization, is straightforward as far as um, <clears throat> I mean the, the interaction is concerned, its functionality is concerned. But sometimes it gets blurred the the interaction between I mean data catalog and the and the query engine and the, the storage itself. So I wanted to understand. You know, I mean, at least in in a in a more common architecture that you guys have deployed, uh, Amundsen, how it uh, plays with uh, what tools that uh, that uh, that would compose the big picture of the, the data lake. Yeah. So the most common integrations are with four systems. The first one is a data lake or a data warehouse. So this could be anywhere from. Um, Athena, Presto, uh, to like Snowflake, BigQuery. And with these systems, there's two levels of integration. One is integrating with their information schema. Uh, and the other level of integration is with their query logs. So we are able to get information about what data exists and then who's using data, how's that data being populated, uh, and what what tables or columns are creating other tables or columns in that particular system. So that's like integration with your most fundamental storage substrate, like data lake or data warehouse. Well, interesting that you mentioned uh, data lake. So you, what you just mentioned, you know, uh, Athena, AWS Athena and Presto, and also Dremio is another one. It's, uh, I would call a query engine that connects to a big storage, which yeah. the big storage, let's say, think about Azure or AWS S3 or Google Cloud or a Hive or whatnot, you know, a, a database of any sorts. Uh, <clears throat> so why did you call uh, Presto a, a data lake itself? instead of being a query engine. I mean, do you have a particular reason for that? Uh, I, I don't know if this, this is a great reason, but, and I'm also happy to hear how other people say it, but to me, like a storage medium without a querying interface is, is not really uh, a distinction that most people think about. And mm -hmm. so Presto store, like Presto is a query engine that your data could be stored on S3, could be stored elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then Snowflake and, and BigQuery actually don't even let you think about those things, right? Like you think of them as a data warehouse and they have storage and compute linked to them. And so like to me, like um, the, the integration with Amundsen is more related to the querying part. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I club them all in one category. Okay, well, that's reasonable. So uh, how do you pronounce this? Amun I, I was saying Amundsen. Amundsen, yeah. I, it's a Norwegian thing. I, I can guarantee you all of us pronouncing it wrong. So it, it, <laughs> the right way to do it in, Norwe in Norwegian, probably Amundsen. Uh, Amundsen. And then there's the most common variants are Amundsen and Amundsen. Okay. Okay. Well, cool. cool. So I, I would love to quickly just share with you the other three kinds of integrations, a total of four. And then mm -hmm. uh, we can dig into questions or other comments from Coulter and Brian as well. 
Um, Do you have a picture? Yeah, I have a picture. Okay, cool. So the picture that um, that the part we are discussing is this bottom right corner where it says supports. And so the databases or data warehouses or query engines is the layer we just talked about. I was going to talk mm -hmm. about the other three systems. So the next system is orchestration tools. So this is your airflow, your prefect, things of that nature, or glue. The next layer is dashboarding tools, which is Tableau, MetaBase, Looker, uh, mode. Uh, and the fourth system is HR system. So like uh, people can bring in teams information or um, employee information, and we can we can use that to show it in the uh, various different people pages that Amundsen has today. Okay. Uh, sorry, in, in this picture, they talk about metadata sh sources. I mean, where where is the data itself? I'm not sure I understand, Luis. Could you rephrase your question? Yeah, well, <clears throat> we're talking about, I mean, suppose you have, a, as your end storage, you have AWS S3. Yeah. Right? So that's not shown in the picture. That's what I'm saying. Correct. You, yeah, that's because you were you were querying that data in S3 I, through a query engine, like you were saying earlier, right? So our integration is with the query engine, not necessarily with the underlying storage S3 or Azure DLS. Okay, and, and, and where is the query engine in this picture? Uh, so Hive, Redshift, represent Presto, represent those query engines. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Presto is there, I see. Yeah, so can I jump Please. in? Please, hi, Brian, welcome. Hi, I think, thanks, Mark. Yeah, so I can actually come, I'm a, a developer advocate uh, in the Trino community. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think some of the confusion there can be like, uh, you know, uh, if you're using the Hive model, typically you're, you're still uh, storing that into a Hive Metastore. Um, this represented all in the same kind of like layer here. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, actually that's going to be, you know, in a, um, in a MySQL database, or it could even be, you know, there's an optional mode for Presto or Trino to basically be, um, you know, storing that into like a file, uh, not typically a, a production level type setting you'll, you'll have there. And sure. then uh, more recent uh, kind of table formats like uh, Iceberg or things like that, um, you know, they'll, they'll typically store a lot of the metadata like down in with the uh, storage itself. So, um, so when you have like, uh, um, let's say Iceberg, you're going to have like that, the uh, basically a, a persistent tree layer or a, a persistent tree sitting inside of object storage. And that's actually where the metadata is going to reside mostly. Um, and so it's, it's uh, no longer going to be having to rely on some separate like MySQL database. So where the metadata is, is kind of fluid depending on what exact table format you're using. And that's why I think it's kind of difficult to just, you know, it's easy, especially from, from the context of what a Munson cares about. Uh, I think it's it's only caring about like this where you know, this metadata where the data is located all of that's stored in the metadata and that could be in a couple different locations so you know and, and maybe Redshift and and Postgres Postgres you know it stores it internally in its own little table um, Redshift is I don't, actually don't know how where Redshift stores it but I'm sure I'm assuming it's in some sort of like local thing so it's it's going to be different depending on what exact uh, storage you're using and uh, what exact table format specifically for data lakes the table format is going to be uh really depending on you know where uh or is really going to uh tell you what the actual um location of that metadata is going to be okay yeah I, th thanks brian i agree with that and then to add another level of complexity is we we do need query um access logs and those are always in the query, based on the query engine, regardless of what storage you need. So that are going to come from Trino, regardless of whether my data was in Hive or in a flat file or whatever else. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense to have uh, a Munson talking directly to AWS S3, for example. It will always go through a query engine. Is that a fair statement? I would say that, so um, in the companies I've talked to, there's only one time where I've talked about 
um, Amundsen accessing the um, audit logs of S3 is when they had uh, some internal scalding jobs that were reading data directly from S3 um, mm -hmm. as data sets instead of going through a query engine like Glue in order to uh, to like have this data be like represented in a much more structured form. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, uh, it would make sense, but they were definitely in the large minority. Okay, that's fair. Thank you very much. Okay. So what, what is usually the format that uh, the data, the metadata takes? It, it, it depends on each, each of these cases. Is that correct? Uh, there are integrations, so you don't have to worry about the format, but I can walk you through one example integration here uh, that would look like. So say you use, uh, let me actually, so here's a Dremio one. Uh, and you, you would specify in this example, you put like the Dremio user password and host name, and then you run this job, which is a data builder job. You can orchestrate that through Airflow or Tron or something else. And similar to this, there should be a Trino, maybe Trino or Presto extractor as well. Trino, it's, it's short Trino. for Neutrino. Ah, I see. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, I have seen some documentations on this, but I'm not able to find it right now. So there, all the extractor docs are in this data builder folder, which you can find them here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Does that answer your we question, to, Luis? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We have to get to you some docs, by the way, or is that, uh, does each individual connector usually provide you the doc documentation or do you all write? documentation for how to connect to. That's something I, I'd like to know, especially if, uh... Yeah, so the person who creates the connector usually ends up contributing it here. And then as a part of uh, contributing a connector, you also submit docs. Uh, okay. And so the Trino slash Presto extractor has existed for a while. Uh, and um, at least on the front page, it lists it. So I'm not sure what the what the status of that is. Maybe it's the extractor, but the docs don't exist. And if so, we should, we will fix that. Yeah. Or um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that is the case, but because uh, one of the, the, I think it was, yeah, I, I don't remember who was the one who added this Trino notification here. We can, it might've been David. Yeah, uh, probably was David. Looks, so I, I can reach out to him and see if he needs me to work on some of the documentation there. Yeah, and I'm happy to review it and commit it as and when you add. Perfect. Do you guys have, could send me some, uh, I mean, pointers to documentation on Amundsen? Uh, why don't I just paste them over here and then that would be the best path. Okay. Um, have you gone through the doc site already? I think I have. I have done, gone some, but uh, sometimes there are other documents that may not be represented there. Okay. Um, I, I do we, know some of the links are broken for some of those docs. Okay. But I think the docs still exist. Okay. So, um, if you if, wanna, yeah, if you wanna send me the links, or uh, happy to receive a PR from you as well. If if you wanna fix those links, would happy to. Oh yeah. Or, um, that would be phenomenal. I think it's on the actual Munson website itself, not on the. Ah, I see. The hub stuff. Got it. Okay. We'll take a look. And then here's the other link of docs, which is first mm -hmm. is main doc site. And then second is the extractor docs. Um, we could do a little bit of rotation and Luis come back to you. Uh, I know you have more questions, but I wanted to just hear a little more Coulter, perhaps going to you next. Um, I, I realize you were at 1-800-CONTACTS. Just tell us a little more about yourself and uh, what's on your mind and what brought you here today. Yeah, so uh, like you said, I'm, I'm working at 1-800-CONTACTS and uh, I'm actually a new data engineer. I was a, a data analysis engineer before this and um, getting into the data engineering world. Uh, so a lot of this stuff is very new and this is actually the first kind of full stack type thing that I've... Mm -hmm was working on to try to implement here. Um, I guess 
my main question is, and it, and I did find Dorian's kind of like uh, production step by step guide. It seems like it's still a work in progress. Um, but diving into some of the source code, it seems like most of the configuration happens in, you know, your Python config files with your extractors and all that stuff. Um, I guess my questions are more of if I were to deploy this, um, what would be kind of like the the steps to go through? Like, what are the key steps to go through to get something? Like, for example, we're using Databricks, um, and I know uh, uh, one of the co-creators works at Databricks, or both of them. Um, and so they could probably help out there, but and there's a lot of different features within a Munson, and then there's also features that people add to a Munson for their kind of local deployments of a Munson, right? Yeah. Um. So I guess as far as like, okay, you know, and and I was having some troubles with this quick start guide on Windows. Uh, someone mentioned that maybe I need to uh, re reclone it with symbolic links enabled on on Git, and that might fix it. Um, if it doesn't, then I'll try running it through uh, an Ubuntu instance on my Windows machine to try to deploy it. But um, yeah, I guess my questions are more of like, what are the key parts of these the source code for deploying it? I, I mean, I'm assuming you know Data Builder, some of the front end stuff for you know. Um, just customization things, um, yep. and then what? What's past that essentially? Um, like to get the tagging to work, to um, like how it how it works with like Neo4j um, as like a metadata store. Yeah, is that what it's? I guess I'm I'm making the assumption that's what it's used for, but yeah. Um, I think you're on the right track. So like, if I were to go back to this diagram that we were just seeing, there are four parts to Amundsen. Like the first one is a front-end service. The other one is this uh, metadata service, which is powered by a graph database. The default for that is Neo4j. Uh, the third one is a search service that's uh, powered by Elasticsearch. And the fourth one is this data builder um, connectors, which actually extract metadata. So in order to... Um, to deploy this, this is the guide you were already referring to. So let me mm -hmm. share with you what this is here. Um, so yeah, the first step is usually like uh, following this quick start guide and building a code repository that's uh, bringing up all these microservices. Usually there's some customization you had to do in front end for like enabling certain features to show up, so on and so forth. So the process for that is documented here as well. Um, and the last thing you'd have to do uh, for the very basic sort of minimal setup would be to create these data builder connectors, modify the Python config files, and orchestrate them to an orchestrator to run every so often, right? Like six hours or 12 hours or 24 hours, whatever you want to choose. So okay. those are the main main pieces. Does that answer any, any would, other place? Where this you would probably do? work with AWS Batch as an orchestration tool. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have any like popular Helm? Is there like popular Helm charts that anybody's in one of the communities put together for this? There is a Helm chart. I don't. I don't know if I have the link handy. Uh, uh, with is it right supported now. by? Is it a, a a community like official supported one, or is it just like a like somebody in the community uh, put it together? Uh, no, it's it's. Uh, I believe it was created by Verdon and uh, at Stemma. Uh, I've okay. seen them modify this quite heavily and there were some changes too. like there's one place where the image, for example, didn't have OIDC configured and we were trying to, he was trying to change that. So I'm not super on top of all the details there, but there's a Helm chart that's fairly, uh, fairly good. And um, Devoted oh. Health, for example, <clears throat> is a company that uses Amundsen used the Helm chart to deploy that stuff. Awesome. Yeah. This is um, something I'm looking into right now too. Is um, I uh, there? There's a lot of talk with like um, you know data mesh and uh, uh, pieces, and so Munson comes up a lot in these conversations. And so, um, are you? 
Are you familiar with data mesh, uh, Mark? Yeah, pretty familiar. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I've trying to think of like a, uh, kind of a, either a blog initially, and then maybe move this into some sort of a piece that I, for a book that I'm writing, uh, where we take some, some very like opinionated pieces. So taking a Munson, taking Trino and, uh, particularly having, I think the only way we can use a Ranger, uh, uh, integration is you have to have the Atlas backend is from, from what I could see. Yep. So you would have Atlas on, on your kind of graph data backend, and then you would in integrate Ranger into there. And that kind of gives you a lot of the, not everything, right? I know that there's like a lot involved, especially from a human side to data mesh, but then like that gives you a lot of the techno technology pieces that you might be able to work with. And I wanted to kind of create either my own Helm chart that kind of takes in a like, you know, kind of stands up Trino as the kind of opinionated piece for the, you know the the query engine that pulls together all the all the different dom, you know data from the different domains. Yep. And then a Munson would be essentially your your catalog of your search. And yep. then ultimately have Ranger as kind of the um, the the computational uh, you know governance in terms of your security uh, aspect yep. there. So yep. so this is kind of where I'm looking at and yeah like having some sort of uh, like Helm chart. That is already out there. I think is is some some piece that I'd like to uh, to to look at. And definitely, if you know, if you guys are interested in collaborating on anything like maybe a blog piece about setting up this this opinionated um, uh, kind of data mesh in a box, uh, I'd like to yeah. reach out to you as well. Yeah, happy happy to collaborate. And uh, at least a blog post I think would be a good place to start, so we can we can get rolling sure. on that. Yeah, cool. and this will help. You know. Coulter and anybody else who's looking to having difficulties with these types of like, you know, getting it, getting the first steps in and trying to figure out how to actually just get something running. Sometimes it's like these things are talked about too much in theory and there needs to be like, you know, an opinionated piece that takes away the decisions from you and you can just get your hands dirty right away and start playing with something. Yeah. I think that's the biggest hurdle that and, and mostly, I think it's probably a hurdle for me specifically, just because, you know, pretty much all of this stuff is new to me. I mean, I've been uh, a data engineer a lot for a month people. and a half. <laughs> and there's so many people flexing into the data engineering space. And there's like all these brand new terms, yeah. like data mesh is this ridiculously new term that you're starting to see pop up all over the place. It's kind of like the replacement of data lakes is what a lot of people are saying, or, or you know, or at least a, an augmentation to it. And so it's like you, you have all these terms and these, these, you know, different vendors pushing in these different directions of what's important. And so, yeah, it's, it's a lot to take in when you're, when you're first ramping up, uh, just to even get like, an understanding of you know what's important specifically to one eight hundred contacts. You know what yeah. are we doing here today that that I need to actually learn so to you know be be successful. So yeah, so yeah, makes sense. Cool, Luis. Going back to you, any other questions or areas you want to dig into? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> have you guys heard about Absolver? Absolver. I know that name, but I don't know if I I have to remind myself of that actually is. Same. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's sort of a, uh, it, it calls itself a, uh, an ETL tool. You okay. know, it can, it can uh, insert or can receive data. Uh, and also it can uh, transform data. Okay. So do some curation type of, of work on, on the data. Okay. And, uh, and those are activities that certainly would be of interest to a Munson to, to, to keep track of the, the data lineage, for example, right? Yep. As uh, suppose a user is using AppSolver to receive data from some streaming source yep. and then, you know, t touch up this data in some way or fashion to the user needs, yep. changing it to the user needs. So the, the, the data lineage of that, that, that is a result of those, those operations, I yep. understand, should be of interest to a Munson, right? To record that, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with you. I think there's like a few things to say about lineage. The first one is that there's lineage within a system. So you take like your data lake or your data warehouse and say you like run insert into select star queries from Trino or Snowflake or something like that. 
And that stuff is fairly well understood by, by Amundsen. You can, you have a model for lineage and you can say like this particular column comes from this particular column and it's all within the same data warehouse, right? Mm -hmm. um, what we don't have in Amundsen today are parsers that come out of the box for these things. And in fact, like I am, I'm one of the creators of Amundsen and I, I co-founded a company Stemma and so Stemma has these parsers, right? So it populates lineage for you in the Amundsen model uh, and makes it really easy for you to actually have that graph built in. Having said that, there's also lineage that comes from uh, from system boundaries. So like if you were using Fivetran or Upsolver to ingest data from one place to the other, then you need to know that from Fivetran or Upsolver that this is the place where like this data came from. And that's the place where uh, we have more work to do. We don't have integrations to actually ingest data uh, from these integrations as to what was the source outside the system. And I think V0 of that would be creating an API where someone can just send us information and say like, I am about to populate this particular data set in Trino. It was generated from this particular data set in like Kafka topic that it's coming from. And it was ingested via Fivetran or Upsolver or something like that. Uh, V1 of that would be actually direct native integration with these systems. So the API for, for the product doesn't need to be called and it could just be like obtained from the regular runs of the ingestion or replication framework. So I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood your last statement. One, you said one solution is to integrate a Munson directly with one of those, uh, those tools like Absolver or, or the other ones you mentioned? That's right, yeah. So one solution, the first V0 version of that is for these tools to send an API call to Amundsen saying, hey, I'm about to, about to create this data set or update this data set and it's coming from here. Uh, but the onus of sending that API call either lies on the, the company like Upsolver or more than likely on you who has both Upsolver and Amundsen. Uh, the V2 is that you don't have to do any work and the integration between Upsolver and Amazon is, is uh, out of the box. And then if you are using both of those two systems, like uh, Amazon is always up to date as to which data is being produced from what source and when it was last updated. Okay. But this doesn't exist yet, right? It does not exist today, correct. Right. The first solution you mentioned, supposedly, uh, I would have to change Absolver to call the Amundsen API? N no, you would, you would have a, uh, an API call that augments your Upsolver job, right? And so after the job is complete, you make an API call yourself to Amundsen slash demo. Okay, so uh, I would encapsulate uh, Upsolver in some tool that I make myself or a script or whatnot. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, okay. I implement the usage of the yeah. uh, Amundsen API. <clears throat> yeah. That's feasible. Sure. And uh, I suppose you, uh, as a step for you guys, uh, the Amundsen guys, as, as these new tools show up in the market, you probably, or somebody of the community would be implementing uh, an inter a direct integration out of, uh, right out of the box for that, right? Is, Absolutely. is that the normal evolution of a Munson, right? Yeah, that's how it's worked with uh, all the existing integrations too. So like, you know, we would add like five integrations for like data warehouses and then the, the rest five or 10 come from community members. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the integrations that we at Stemma add are the ones that our customers would want. And so um, I don't, transparency, I don't have any customers today with Upsolvers. Um, so mm -hmm. like our focus has been on other integrations and things like Fivetran, for example, come up more often for us than, than Upsolver right now, but that may change. Fivetran? Yeah. Okay, I have never heard of that. All right. Uh, okay. Well, another question that I would have is more on the logistics things. If we would adopt uh, Amundsen, how we would work with uh, would we work with uh, the Amundsen community? Let's say if we need to make some upgrades or changes to Amundsen to add integration portions to our system. Let's say how could that be done? 
yeah. or request somebody to do it for us. I don't know. Yeah. What's the process? Yeah. So there are two. The, the, if you interact with the open source community, you would put up a PR, like one of the Amundsen committers, myself included, could review it uh, and give you some feedback. You incorporate the feedback, it gets it get done. Um, that's the sort of high level flow. Mm -hmm. um, and while this is an open source community meeting, so I don't want to take too much time talking about Stemma, but if like for Stemma customers, which is the managed version of Amundsen with some additions, like the lineage parts that I was talking about, uh, that you um, you just make a request to the to the company, right? And we are all, like half the company's committers on Amundsen today, and we we build that integration and deploy that for the for the um, for the customer. So you won't have to do any work there. Right, so there will be a contract of some sort and we will pay you for that work, right? Uh, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. We should do a follow-on call as to what that looks like. It's not simply a support thing, right? It's a, it's a subscription for the product and integrations right. come as a part of the, the whole sure. subscription. Okay. Uh, okay, no, great. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to understand the nature of the interaction. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Good. Yeah. So yeah. To the summary of that is you're not at that you're not using Amundsen like you're using Stemma, and then Stemma is providing a Amundsen like thing for you and managing that, and has integrations that are built into it. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I suppose. Uh, I mean, I, th those are the questions I had, really. Cool. Um, Coulter, any anything on your mind? Um. Mostly basic, basic questions probably. Um, are there any like demos of people going through kind of like an Amundsen installation on like a mock data warehouse or something like that? Mm. Um, or is that not available? And also, I, so what are the one of the questions in the Slack community was if if there was like basically he was asking if someone could like some consultant to help them stand it up yeah um you know as like a, a one-time payment type thing yeah. just to help set it up type thing if you know anyone that does that kind of stuff okay i can i can follow up with you and send you a bunch of um, information on that uh, okay. including some guides as well as people that might be helpful okay and Brian, anything on your mind? Any? I'm kind of curious to hear what you're working on in Trino and how you found Amundsen and what your thoughts on the project are thus far. Yeah, so um, I actually did have a question regarding like, uh, I, I've been trying to look into like a lot of the different solutions and Amundsen is definitely like, you know, I think the, the outstanding solution so far in like open source community. So, I mean, great job. I, I, uh, I actually learned about you through Paco Nathan Mm -hmm. uh, we did a, a, a bit of a, a conversation in, um, back in February where I had him a, a kind of leading a discussion in a panel with uh, Martin, Dana, and David. Uh, uh, the, uh, by the way, the, Martin, Dana, and David, for those that don't know, they're the uh, creators of Presto, and now they're working on Trino. And so basically, um, they, uh, we were just talking about data governance and kind of like the the fact that Trino doesn't solve all of your problems, you know, and <laughs> when it comes to like bringing stuff all together, it's actually a lot about having like conversations and getting people aligned. And so, you know, of course, uh, Amundsen very naturally came up in this. And so I, uh, I started looking into some of your initial blogs and stuff and uh, yeah, and I really, really got into like, this is something that I had been looking for for a long time, just because even before I was working with uh, the Trino community and Starburst and everything, I, I was, uh, you know, using Trino and always wondering like, how do I, like, we did this really weird thing where we like any, uh, uh, concept in our company, we would actually just like map that concept in, uh, in this wrapper that we had around a JDBC. <laughs> and it would basically say like, so thing one, you know, uh, let's call it like a ball, you know, if you wanted to, to talk to the ball. Uh, tables that may be uh, like in the data layer side, there may be like five different locations where like information about the ball, you know, the, the size, the color might be in different like locations and tables, but mm -hmm. like we needed to hide that kind of information. 
and ultimately mapped some sort of view to, to you. And so a view might be was one way that we could handle this. But um, but then there were other things like, you know, the, the kind of tracking of, you know, how do you as the schema changes and all that stuff. And so I'd always wondered, like, there's the at, at, at my vantage point from the data engineering perspective, like there wasn't any way to do that. And so mm -hmm. this, I mean, once we had this conversation about data governance and that this was a trending topic and metadata was becoming really big, like, you know, it, it was, it was really like a, an exciting thing for me to, to hear about this. Mm -hmm. So, so I started looking into a lot of these things. And one of the other projects that I, that I see uh, that's um, called uh, Ageria. Mm -hmm. is it, I don't know if it's Ageria or Ageria. 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 So they seem to be doing uh, something that I think is also really interesting that I was hoping like a month it would, I don't know if they're, you guys are planning on it or looking into it, but like they're making like a, they, they, their main focus is really on the standard and less on the implementation. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I, I don't know if like, have you in the Amundsen community, have you thought about either like integrating or adopting some, some pieces of the open standard or even creating your own open standard? So I feel like that's one of those things that like, you know, and we, we don't like have any open, open standard on our, our end either. So I know it's like, it's not an easy thing to do, but I really mm -hmm. like commend, you know, com communities like Iceberg who made an open standard around this stuff. And I was, mm -hmm. I actually put out a tweet the other day as I was like looking into this stuff. I was like, I just wish like, you know, Project Ageria and Amundsen would make a baby and like <laughs> would have the personality of uh, Ageria, but then like the looks of, of a Munson. And so, uh, so it's kind of like, I don't know if you, have you guys thought of anything in terms of like standards or anything like that, that you've, you've thought about making from, from a Munson. Cause like in terms of one last little thing that would make me like, oh yeah, like a Munson, there's no turning back. Like it would be like that you guys would open up the standard, like a, a standard around. And, and that way, you know, like when other things start trying to integrate with a Munson, it just becomes this very clear, oh yeah, we just follow the standard and that's how we do it. Yeah. Um, we have, but I would say that we haven't put, we have thought about it. We haven't put energy or effort in it just yet. I think our goals right now have been sort of prioritizing on the user experience, the integrations yeah. and delivering that. The yeah. two places where we have seen standards, one is Ageria, like you mentioned. The other one is the Open Lineage Project, which is also like, um, is, I know they're talking to Ageria as well, but I don't know what the state of those conversations is. The goal yeah. of these integrations would be to then make like, standards for ingesting and integrating existing data solutions. So like, you know, for Trino or for like Tableau to send data to a Munson would be, would be like a standard way to do that. Yeah. Um, I don't think any of these projects have gotten to a point where uh, it's like a no brainer for us to invest. It's like a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. And because of the problems we are solving right now, which are all like, how do we, get more community members help, like things that, for example, Coulter was asking about like development guides and just like getting started guides, yeah. a help and chart, like we're just focused on that. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, we have enough integrations right now that like the standard part is not like an urgent thing for us to work on. But as those standards evolve and mature, I, I, I would be definitely pretty supportive of integrating with them. Yeah, that would be great. That'd be, that's, that's cool. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's like some even potential thing, wait, like, even if it's down the road, uh, cause that's, that's what I, the last thing, you know, like, uh, a Munson definitely are in, a, in this period of growth and like getting people on, on boarded and, and kind of, you know, this is the space where everybody's kind of ramping up right now anyways. So I think mm -hmm. like, that's just going to happen organically, but, yeah. uh, so it makes sense that that's where your focus is on right now. But I, I, I definitely am I'm glad to hear that that's something I, I think like, you know, Egeria and, and the and the open lineage project sounds like uh, you know if they as they kind of mature as well like you know piggybacking or kind of utilizing the the standards that they've already done and just putting it with a Munson would be like I think that would just basically be the end all like that's the solution you go with at that point uh, yeah so yeah that makes sense yeah so that's something I was just kind of curious about and uh, and yeah being able to like you know get get this piece where you're doing these interoperability like it gets us to that next future mm -hmm. stack of data engineering where you have all of this capabilities that can become decentralized a little more mm -hmm. you know like the whole idea where the domains can actually do this stuff like that would be one of the key central toolings that i think mm -hmm. that would be required to actually 
like support this where you don't have to have the centralized data team anymore. It's like, you know, you basically have same way that we do DevOps, you know, it would just be a data ops people on all these different little nodes mm -hmm. and then they would just sync together. We would get like, you know, the ability to see across this entire, um, mm -hmm. this entire uh, vantage point um, from a central uh, a place so that we can find all of each other's stuff. But then, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's really cool. And I, I, I don't have any questions or anything other than that, you know, basically I just, uh, I'll, I'll hopefully be getting this, um, uh, this thing off the, uh, uh, started and yeah, I'd like to see about getting like a, an initial blog, some initial thing to help, you know, data engineers like, uh, like Coulter, uh, try yeah. to get, you know, uh, up to speed a little bit faster. Great. No, would love to work with you on that. Awesome. Well, it occurred to me, uh, another question when, mm -hmm. can I say now or please? Yeah. Okay. If, if we adopt a month in, and we have a team that will be doing some project on data lakes, uh, including a Munson in it. Uh, would uh, the Munson community have any, any training class or training mm. type? Uh, because supposedly, you know, I, I jump into this bandwagon and I want to add something that a Munson doesn't have. Yeah. So some integration with App, App, App Solver, for example, just, a, yeah. just an example. You know, you know, it would be hard for me to jump into the Munson code. I mean, raw and, and start changing it. Yeah. <laughs> or adding to it. Yeah. I mean, if, the, if there will be some training on that, you know, technical yeah. training, I mean, even if paid, of course. Yeah. Uh, that's what, that's my question. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I don't, I don't uh, ha have one today. And I think if, if that was important to you, I would suggest you choose like a proprietary or commercial offering then than like trying to train people on the Amundsen, the Amundsen code base, you know, like ultimately you want to deliver value for your organization fast, right? Right, right. And uh, training is like one way for you to train your engineers so they can your make make changes. But then there's probably other ways that are that may be worth exploring here. Okay, is there is there such a thing like suppose we we hire an expert on Amundsen for yeah. some time? Yeah. To work with our, our team, yeah, and to pass on knowledge, supposedly, yeah, would that be uh, feasible? Yeah, why don't I spend some more time with you, Luis, as to like what your goals are, and uh, and I think that would be more of a stemma conversation than an Amundsen conversation. Sure. Yeah, so we can we can dig into that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Cool. Um, anything from you, Coulter, Brian? No, I think that's good. All right, well, thank you for making uh, time. What I'll do is I have two follow-ons. One is to set up a follow-on conversation with Luis and then send Coulter some demo of the people, uh, the demo of people going through the installation with mock data and any other guides that I may have here. Um, so I'll do that. And Brian, uh, one, one follow-on for you is to just hit me up whenever you want to talk further about the blog post. Yep, will do. Thanks, Mark. Nice cool. meeting you, by the way. All right. Yeah, nice meeting you all. Take care. Thank and, you. Uh, be well. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot, Mark. Of course. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.